welcome back. Uh, let's do a little bit of history as an appetizer. The ideas behind the current boom in artificial intelligence have been around for quite a long time. People were talking about this and working on code around this in the 1960s. There's this fun YouTube video we linked showing you how Claude Shannon and IBM Labs were using a early form of AI to do Russian to English translations. Super interesting. And also kind of fun to note that even back then, Claude Shannon, who was um, the Andrew Ang of his day, or the uh, Fei Fei Li, was talking about how he thought in the 1970s uh, you might see science fiction versions of AI. Well, it's 2017, and people now are still saying within 10 to 15 years, something like Haley Joel Osment in the movie AI is going to pop up that still seems a bit unlikely, but we're closer than ever to it. Um, for some more background on where AI is now and how uh, deep learning has really changed the landscape, you should watch this short TED Talk given by Joshua Bengio on the rise of AI through deep learning. If you are of a nerdier sort and are not afraid of a lot of math being thrown at you, uh, you should watch this longer talk from uh, Deep Learning School, uh, which talks about the mathematical foundations and some of the problems to solve in the deep learning space. For those of you with a more literary bent, this article in the New York Times Magazine, The Great AI Awakening, is this fun read about the history of deep learning and the key players involved, mostly in um, there's there's only like 10 to 15 people and 10 institutions over the last 20 years that have really contributed to deep learning. We have organizations like the uh, University of Toronto. Um, we have Stanford, clearly, Google, a bunch of other places that have been investing quite a lot in AI R&D. So um, why are neural networks back in vogue? Uh, neural networks are not a new idea. The first paper published on perceptrons came out in 1958. The whole math behind backpropagation was um, published by Hinton and also Likud in that era in 1986. The first paper on convolutional neural networks was published in 1998. And then we had this 15-year, 20-year gap, really. So the kind of difference between then and now is really about the compute. You should, um, if you want to keep up with deep learning research and to know more about it, don't wait for books to come out. The field is moving so fast that new things are being discovered at the rate of one a month, practically. By the time somebody writes a book, everything in that book will be completely and wholly outdated. I would suggest paying attention to these Scholars, the Kluan, Hinton, Bengu, Andrew Ang, Fifi Lee, they've been publishing quite a lot of really excellent work. Read, again, them and the institutions they were involved with, their grad students, for example, have been publishing a lot of really interesting work, too. So these things, these, these concepts that had been designed 20 years ago are now practical because now we are in a world with huge quantities of big data. Um, we can do a lot of parallel computation on fast GPUs. The hardware has caught up. Uh, number one, the processing hardware has caught up. Number two, the quantity of data we can train these models on is exponentially increased. Um, and number three, we have this whole ecosystem of startups, cloud compute, open source tools, uh, which open up this whole field. That's why it's so exciting. It's not just academic work being done in a lab anymore. It is work that is accessible to people like you and me uh, who don't have super supercomputers at work. This is just um, a really fun example of deep learning here. So what this, this guy, Chris Rodley, did is he took a book of pictures of dinosaurs and he took a book of a picture of flowers and he trained them on each other. And so what you see here now is a Tyrannosaurus rex made out of flowers. Pretty cool. Applications for deep learning are like really varied. In this course, we're going to talk about the underlying concept of deep learning and go through convolutional neural networks. Uh, but CNNs are just one form of deep learning and one form of artificial neural networks. You have stuff that like generative adversarial networks. Uh, you have 
implementations of reinforcement learning that are really cool. Uh, there's a billion families of deep learning out there, each with its own specific implementations, um, and all of which are out there waiting and ready and waiting for you to um, get started. In terms of performance, neural networks are amazing. This is ImageNet. These are the results from ImageNet, which is the standard image recognition contest that academic papers um, kind of measure their performance against. Um, so in the last, uh, just in the last uh, five, six years, we've, we've seen huge jumps in improvement. The best um, image recognition model in 2011 still had an error rate of above 0.25. Um, we had this like big jump of improvement in 2013. In this 2012, 2013 era, uh, CNNs kind of came back into vogue here. Uh, you see Clarify, the Clarify model, which is, by the way, um, and now they're a startup now uh, with a commercially available convolutional neural network API. And you now see in 2016, 2017 that neural networks are outperforming humans at identifying images, which is very, very interesting to see. On CIFAR 10, which is another image um, recognition contest, we really are at this place where you see this like huge jump in improvement in the 2010s, early 2010s. And now, very recently, in the last two years, again, neural networks are outperforming humans. Computer chess, machine learning has been outperforming humans for a long time, ever since Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. Computers have been very, very good at chess. I think chess is also one of those games that is more rules-based, so it is easier to train. It is, in fact, easier to train machine learning models against it. So, all right, 2008. Um, and now the your standard uh, chess AI can uh, outperform the best possible human ELO rating. Uh, this is like the best possible rating that a human has ever achieved. Um, DeepMind has been doing quite a lot of interesting work in this space lately. You might have heard of AlphaGo, uh, which is their model that has beaten humans at Go, a game substantially more complex than chess. Um, and quite soon, uh, they'll be uh, releasing AI to play StarCraft games now. Um, so interesting story, early versions of AlphaGo played online games against, uh, online Go games against players. So for those of you out there who play StarCraft competitively, um, if you start encountering a player with a radically different play style that starts terrible but keeps winning afterwards, uh, you might be playing against a DeepMind AI. Now, knowing all of that, uh, what we want to do with you is to grow your intuition on the fundamentals of deep learning. Um, the idea is to that we can't possibly learn everything out there. Uh, it's just not practical. It doesn't make sense. Every person uh, taking this course has a different application they're interested in. But what we do want is for you to know enough to understand what's going on under the hood of the standard deep learning models and know how to learn about new and exotic types of neural networks. RNNs, GANs, CNNs, LCMs, etc. There's just so many more. And you might be creating your own model and publishing it too um, someday soon. We also want to give you real coding experience going end to end from data loading, model building, and deployment on uh, GPUs and being able to apply that knowledge to working with future setups. I find that just doing something once in a very defined way helps me for when in the future, um, you know, instead of deploying on the standard ML engine, Google Cloud ML engine, um, what if I want to do something on GPUs, then that's only like one thing I need to learn in debug versus 500 things I need to learn in debug at the same time. Um, and last, um, you know, the hope and dream of the Department of Science and Technology is that you will start coming up with ideas for Philippine-centric deep learning research. How can we contribute to the global community of deep learning work?